pride. Pride is something that can really close us up. I know the things, what to do. For example, I have been in this priesthood, I have been in this religious life for 15 years, or for 20 years, for 25 years. Now this person coming up, just received priesthood or just being vested, how can this person tell me anything which is worth listening to? I have much more experience than this person or this priest or this religious. I know things better than the other. Now if I have that kind of attitude again, I won't be able to listen to the voice of God. I won't be able to listen to that voice of God. I have to be really humble, that's what the scripture says, if I really want to listen to the voice of God. And humility does not mean that I bow down before those who are more powerful than me. That's very easy. If a major superior comes or if bishop comes or if anyone who is having more power and strength and influence than me, if that person comes to me, it's very easy for me to use polite words or to express gestures of respect. It's very easy. And that's not humility. Anyone can do that. Now when I'm saying that, please do not misunderstand. Do not misunderstand. Do not say that now we don't have to respect the superiors or or the major superiors or the bishops or the cardinals or what, whoever that. That's not the point here. According to Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila, she is defining what humility basically is. If you are able to bow down before a person who is less powerful than you, who is having less authority than you, who is having, who are, who is having less influence than you, and that's what humility is. If you are able to behave to this person just as you behave to the person who is more powerful than you, then you can know that you are having this humility. And we know that this is so difficult. This is so difficult to bow down before a person who has less experience or who has less education or who has less skills than me. So difficult. It's nearly impossible without the grace of God. And that's what we learn from the life of Jesus also. That's what true humility is. What is Jesus doing basically? St. Paul is teaching us. He set apart all his heavenly glory. All his heavenly glory he set apart and he's coming down to the earth. He's taking up the form of a slave and then he's been beaten up. He's been abused. He's been humiliated by these mere mortals. Who are these people, by the way? They cannot do anything to Jesus. He's God. Just imagine Jesus standing before these mere mortals with his hands and legs tied up and he is allowing them to do whatever they want. He's allowing them to spit on his face, to humiliate him. And that's what humility is. I am, I am treating the person who is less powerful than me the same way as I treat the person who is more powerful than me. For this again we need the grace of God. We need the power of God. Without this, we cannot really come to this form of humility. We all are people full of pride. There's no doubt about it. We all. If anyone says that I do not have pride, I think that person is deceiving himself or herself. We all are people full of pride. That's the major problem. According to the scriptures, that's the major problem. The problem with Adam and Eve is that problem. The original sin, the sin of pride. Teaching of the church, the same. It is from this pride all the other sins flows out. This is the, the cardinal sin. Of course, all the others are also cardinal, but this is the head, the capital one. From this, everything other, every other thing follows. So as long as I am having this attitude of pride, I cannot listen to the voice of God. I cannot. That's the second thing that we know about about this hardness of heart or hardness of mind. The third thing is the bitterness. The bitterness that has entered our heart or mind. As long as this bitterness is there, we cannot listen to the voice of God. Now why do we say this? Because we said God is going to speak not only through supernatural ways, God can even speak to us through my conference or through someone in my family or maybe through a friend or maybe a person who does not know anything about the church God, God can speak to me if he has spoken to Balaam through a donkey he can even speak to anyone 
So for that, first thing that I must be knowing is, am I bitter? Or am I having any kind of unforgiveness? For example, if I am bitter towards a person, let's take, let's take the example of uh, something wrong happened with me because of the superior. Someone sitting in the place of the authority, or some superior treated me badly. And now that bitterness has come into my heart. After that, whoever comes to that place of authority, I cannot accept whatever he or she is speaking to me. If I really want to listen to the voice of God speaking to this person of authority, I must be first freed from this bitterness. We know there are people who keep on rebelling against those who are in authority or those who are in high places. It could be a case where I was treated badly by this person or some person in the, in the past. And so that stigma is there in my heart still now. I remember a youth coming to me. He was brought by his mother and his mother said, Father, please pray for this boy. He is not going to the church. He was such a good boy. In the childhood, he used to go every day to the Eucharist. And I don't know what happened. After some time, he started speaking against the church, against the Eucharist, against everything. Now, he is so irritated when he speaks or when he listens about anything about God or the Bible. And then I, I made an attempt to speak to this youth. But then, he is not in a mood to listen at all. He's just becoming black and blue. And he is getting so irritated when I speak to him. I was not able to figure out at the beginning. Then slowly when I spent some time with this boy, with this youth, I understood that in the past, some priest, through the hands of a priest, he got a bad experience. And from that time onwards, he cannot see priest or anyone who is in the name of God, or in the name of faith or religion, he cannot see that person giving him the message of God. So if he wants to listen to the voice of God, what he has to first do is, he has to be freed from that bitterness in the heart. Again, this will seem very easy to us. But according to the scripture, this is very difficult. Because there are times that we even do not know that we have bitterness. That's a strange part. We think that we have no unforgiveness. We think that we are completely okay with others. We think that we are reconciled. We think that there is no anger or revenge in my heart. But the truth is, often we do not know that this is operating in our life. And because of which, we are not able to listen to the voice of God. Let's take the letter to Hebrews. Letter to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15. It says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and through it many have become defiled. Now, it's a very good word of God. Worthy to reflect again and again. A very beautiful example being used in order to explain how this bitterness works. It says, the example used there is, it's like a root. This bitterness is like a root that springs again and again in our, in our life. Now when you look around, you'll find how the root operates. The root is always invisible. If you look around, you'll find the shoot. You'll find the tree that has come up above the soil. Where is the root? The root is under the soil. It's not visible so easily. Same is the case with bitterness. The scripture says, this bitterness is often hidden in our heart. It's often hidden. We are not able to see it very clearly. How can we really find out? Only with the help of God. That's why again and again, we, we come back to that words of Jesus. He says, Without me, you cannot do anything. If you really want to understand about yourself, you need my help. I remember a testimony that happened here about a lady. This lady used to come for the retreat. So many times she had come. At least once in a year she would come to attend the retreat. So many problems in her life, so many difficulties, sicknesses, crises. So every time she comes, she, she came with the hope of receiving healing. Or she came with the hope of getting deliverance. But then her situation was the same. She was seeing that every, every week there are testimonies happening here. People are speaking about their testimonies, about the healings, about the miraculous ways God, God intervened in their life. 
And she was wondering, what is happening with me? Why I am not receiving the blessing of the Lord? Or why I am not receiving the grace of the Lord or the healing of the Lord? She writes in the testimony, Last time when I came for the retreat, I was listening to the words of God and the preacher said, the preacher said, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts you of your sin. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts you. Somehow that word entered into her heart and mind. And she decided that she's going to pray to the Holy Spirit. She's not going to waste her time. She's going to come and she's going to spend the time with the Lord praying for this gift of the Holy Spirit. Because only through the Holy Spirit I can, I can get that truth about myself. She said, I started kneeling down before the Lord. I started praying rosaries. I started praying more and more during the free time. And then what happened slowly and gradually she noticed. She started remembering a long list of people with whom she had a grudge. Or she had some difficulties. Till that time she thought that she is reconciled with everyone. That's what she was thinking. Because every time she comes for the retreat, she is listening about forgiveness. So she was saying that she has already forgiven all those people. But then she writes about her experience in that testimony that on that retreat or in that particular day, this is what happened. All these, all these people who gave me bitter experiences or all those unfortunate things that happened in my past, it started surging into my mind. She thought that she had forgiven, but the Spirit of God told her that she had actually not forgiven. There was bitterness and unforgiveness in her heart. Now that's what the scripture is teaching us. It's like the root. It is often invisible. We do not know that it is still operating in our lives. We often say that I have forgiven that person. It's very easy to say that. We all know it. It doesn't take much effort to face a person and say, I have forgiven you. But Jesus is not saying about it. Jesus says, you have to forgive from your heart. Now that's the difficult part. That's so difficult. To get reconciled to a person with the heart is so difficult. For which we need the grace of God. And then she says, she had a sickness. For many years, she had sickness in her hands. Her hands used to have these tremors. That means her hands used to shake and she was not able to do any work with those hands. It was unsteady. She could not even hold a cup of tea. That sick she was. She made the decision to forgive really those people, to visit those people and speak to them. And then with that decision she went to the sacrament of confession. She received the sacrament after the retreat. As for her decision, she went visited those people. Even when they were the people who wronged her, she went and she started talking to them. She started putting all the efforts. She said, some gave good response, some did not give response, but I kept on doing it because that's what the Lord told me. And then she said, at the end of one week, when I visited all the people, the next morning when I got up, I experienced the healing of the Lord in my hands. My hands were not having tremors anymore. It was not having any shaking. It was so steady. I was able to experience the power of God, the grace of God working in my life. So from this testimony, what I came to know about is the validation of this scriptural passage. It's not about the healing that I am focusing here right now. What I am trying to convey is about the bitterness that often operates in a way that we do not understand. It's like a root in our heart. So let us pray to the Lord to reveal such bitterness in our heart and mind that is making us hard towards the word of God or towards the voice of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Shall we all lift up our hands and praise God. Hallelujah. Louder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. Or there are another thing which can stop us from listening to the voice of God or that can make us hard is our prejudices. Our prejudices or our own thought pattern, our own philosophies. We have a definite way of thinking about an issue and we do not want to budge from it. That can really make us hard. It's so important that I free myself from my prejudices, from my preconceived opinions or notions, or the way I have been thinking. I have to empty myself 
of my own thought process. That's why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Now, denying oneself does not only mean that I, I have abandoned my family or all those. Very important is, I have to abandon my own ways of thinking. If I really want to receive the voice of God, I have to abandon my own dreams and desires or my own prejudices. Only then can I be able to receive the voice of the Lord. As long as I am clinging on to my preconceived notions and opinions, I will never be able to listen to the voice of God. The story told about a man who was a little drunk and then he was trying to cross the river. He tried to cross the river, he was, because he was drunk, he was not in his total consciousness. It was night, it was dark, things were not visible. He got into the boat and he started rowing the boat. He started rowed and rowed. And when morning came, consciousness dawned upon him. He realized that he has not moved ahead. He's there, right there. All that effort that he put went in vain. What's the reason? Very simple. He forgot to untie the boat. He forgot to untie the boat. The boat was attached to the bank. And as a result, he could not move ahead. The same is the case with many of us. We are attached to our own thinking pattern. We are attached to our own preconceived notions about an issue. And so we are not able to go ahead. We are not able to go beyond and see what God is trying to tell to me. So there are these four factors. If we sit and think, uh, there are many more that God can reveal to us. Fear, bitterness, pride, preconceived notions or prejudices that can make us really closed to the word of God or to the voice of God. So what Jesus is first asking us is, try to free yourself from this hardness. Let us sit and think, am I sitting here with this kind of attitude? If this is the attitude, I have to get rid of it. If I really want to listen to the voice of God. Now that's the first step. Now as we go ahead, we are actually progressing. The first step is, I have to have the desire to listen to the voice of God. I have to open myself up. I cannot come with a closed heart and mind. I have to open myself. That means, I am coming with a receptive heart. That's the first step. I want to listen to what God is saying to me. That's the first step. The second step, Jesus says, the seed fell on the rocky soil. Now what is this attitude? Let's listen how Jesus is explaining it. Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 8. Jesus says, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But they have no root. They believe only for a while and in a time of testing fall away. Now what is the problem with this attitude? Jesus is specifying it. They receive it. They, they, are, they are joyful, they are peaceful for some time, but then because of the lack of root, they fall away. So the problem with this attitude is they do not have root. In other words, we are people who do not have time to spend with the Lord. What Jesus is speaking here, if you really want to listen to the voice of God, you have to schedule your time. You need to spend substantial amount of time with the Lord. Not just 15 or 10 minutes. Now if you look around, you find trees. And all of them have roots. All of them have roots. If you take the big trees, you know that these roots have not come just in an overnight. It has taken years and years. Roots become stronger and stronger. It becomes deeper and deeper with time. That's what Jesus is teaching. How much time I'm spending with the Lord? Of course, I have the time given to me by the congregation or by the diocese or common prayers. It's all well and good. But apart from that, how much time I'm spending with the Lord? I cannot just squeeze God into that half an hour of meditation. I cannot say that it's only in that half, hour, half an hour of meditation God is going to speak to me. Or that 15 minutes or 30 minutes of liturgy that I am celebrating, that it's only in that time God is going to speak to me. I have to give substantial amount of time to the Lord. 
If I am not willing to do that, I cannot expect to listen to the voice of God. As we said yesterday, we are people who have become very busy with our activities. We are so busy with our activities, with our school, with our hospitals, or with our social work, or with so many other works we are having. Am I able to spend not just 15, 10 or 30 minutes, am I able to spend substantial amount of time with the Lord? If I'm not able to do that, I have to change things in my life. I have to change things in my life because in this way I'm not going to progress. I'm not going to listen to the voice of God. So this is very important. How much time I'm spending. I know that people come here and when, when you speak about, speak to them about their family prayers. When you, when you have your family prayer, they say that when we have that commercial break in that serial, we sit for the family prayer. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to squeeze that prayer in that time of that commercial break. Now God does not work in that way. That you give time to God, that this is the time I have, and then uh, you reveal to me whatever you want to tell. Throughout the day, God is speaking. Throughout the day. Am I spending time with the Lord? Am I attentive to that voice? It's not that I'm attentive only during my, during my stipulated time of prayer. But what about the other times? Jesus says, it's only with the time the root goes deeper and deeper. So that's the point that we can reflect today in my consecrated life or in my priestly life or in my religious life, how much time I'm spending with the Lord personally. I cannot excuse, I cannot have an excuse to the Lord that I'm busy with so many works. Because that's not the first thing. The first thing is spending time with the Lord. The other thing is a secondary. The first thing is, I am spending time with the Lord personally. How I am able to spend, how I am able to come close to the Lord and love Him. That's the first thing we already said yesterday, St. John of the Cross saying, at the end of the day, what's going to count is, how much I love my Lord. I'm not going to be judged according to my activities, but according to how much love I have in my heart for the Lord. So that's the second thing, that I have to give substantial amount of time with the Lord in order to listen to Him. If I don't have time, I cannot listen to Him. I may be listening to my own voice, I may be listening to the voice of the others, I may be listening to the voice of maybe whoever, but I cannot listen to the voice of God. So that's the second progression. First is, I come with a receptive heart. Second is, I'm coming not for just five or ten minutes, I'm coming for a substantial amount of time. That's the second thing. The third step that Jesus is saying is about the thorny bushes. It says, the seed that fell on the thorny soil. What happened with that? Now what's the problem with this attitude? He explains in Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 14. He says, As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Now what is Jesus speaking about here? Okay, first, I am coming to the Lord with a receptive heart. I want to listen to what, what, what God is trying to tell me, first step. Second, I am spending time with the Lord regularly, substantially I am spending time with the Lord. Now, what is the third step I have to do? Jesus says, you have to eliminate the distractions. As long as you are spending time with me, you have to eliminate distractions. It's not enough that I am spending one hour with the Lord, but I am distracted all the time. So many thoughts, so many things, worries and so many cares entering my mind and I'm busy with my SMS, with my email, with my WhatsApp, Facebook and whatever those things are. I'm so busy, so worried about all these things. Jesus says, the time that you are spending with me, you have to examine whether I'm there with my whole heart, mind and soul. And we know that this is so difficult. Praying a rosary is very simple. But then praying the rosary without distraction is so difficult. We know it. Even to recite one Hail Mary is so difficult. Whatever prayers the church is teaching us is trying to convey to us how to pray basically. If the church is asking us, 
let's say, pray a rosary. It's basically the church's way of telling us that it is very difficult, basically. If you hold a rosary and you start praying, you know that by the end of one Hail Mary, your mind is all over the place. Your heart is all over the place. It's so difficult. St. Teresa of Avila says, our mind is like a mad woman. It's like a mad woman. She cannot, or our mind cannot stay in one place. Unless and until we take an effort. If we are not taking an effort, our mind is going to go all over the place. And that's not a surprise. We can sit in the presence of the Lord for one hour, but at the end of that one hour, it might be possible that we have not prayed at all. So what Jesus is saying third is, eliminate distractions. How much effort I am putting in order to eliminate distractions in my prayer? What are these thorns? What are these bushes basically? How do they grow up? How do they grow up? Can anyone answer how do they grow up? What do you have to do in order for these thorns and bushes to grow up? What is it? Anyone can answer? If you want your garden to be full of thorns and bushes, what, what is it that you have to do? You, do? you don't do anything. You don't do anything. You don't go to the garden. You show that neglect and that thorns and bushes will automatically come up. So what we have to do, we have to keep on eliminating these weeds and bushes in order to keep that garden clean and neat and beautiful. It's a continuous effort. So if I am not trying to control my mind, it's very, it's very sure that my mind is going to go all over the place. 